How's everybody doing tonight? After watching what happened to the Cowboys last night, who's ready for baseball season? 58 days till pitchers and catchers? Good Lord, can't get here fast enough. Uh, all right, couple things. Uh, we're about to get underway here. Just wanted to uh, make one thing clear. Apparently, in the back, at some of these things, it can get a little bit chatty in the back. And if it gets chatty in the back, then we can't hear in the front. So as we go tonight, if it gets a little chatty in the back, just want it's totally fine. If you want to go talk, that's fine. But there's an awesome patio back there with free pizza, big giant patio. Uh, so you can head on back to the back if you want to go talk. Uh, we just want to make sure to hear as much as we can from our guest. And we're going to go, uh, you know, just interview style for a while and just no real plan, just uh, talk to our special guest tonight. And then uh, if at, at some point, once we've exhausted that, uh, we will open to Q&A. And then anybody here will be welcome to walk up to this microphone here on my right, and you'll be able to, uh, to get a question in. Uh, let me first say uh, thank you uh, to, this is like the coolest bar I've ever been to because it's, because it's owned by a guy who I love, uh, the great Danny Bayless, who, well, he's giving me the throat cut. I don't know the particulars. I haven't seen the contract, but I just know he's heavily associated with it and, uh, he's a badass and, uh, I love Danny. So, uh, give, give Danny, what? Danny says, give him a round of applause. <laughs> what? Louder, he says. Okay. <laughs> he says, all tops off. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, Ted, take it off. Um, okay, so if it gets a little chatty, just take it on out to the patio. We're about ready to get underway. Um, it's going to be a fun night. And I want to say, first off, Thank you to our friends at uh, Paranoid Fan for making this happen. These guys, this is a up, this is an up and coming company that uh, pretty soon you're going to look up and say, "Good Lord, that company came out of Dallas." It's a rocket ship and it's on its way up. So first of all, follow at Paranoid Fan on Twitter, and second of all, uh, we do we have some friends here from Shutdown Inning. The greatness of Shutdown Inning acquired by Paranoid Fan, now part of the Paranoid Fan family. So give it up for Shutdown Inning. Fantastic uh, baseball blog, unbelievable writers, uh, very, very talented. And uh, so first, let me welcome our, our friends from Shutdown Inning. My name is Ben Rogers. I'm one of the hosts of the Ben and Skin Show. Our show airs from 2 to 6 on 105.3 The Fan. Bounced around a little bit. Appreciate the head nod groups. He's like, I know that. Damn it, wish we could have stolen grooves. Just couldn't do it. Couldn't do it with the payroll. But uh, we love talking baseball on our show. And so I uh, was honored to come out here, no matter what the topic was, to talk baseball. Don't have to twist our arms to talk baseball. And then when the topic was going to be, or the special guest was going to be Jamie Newberg, I'm like, man, I don't care. Whatever I had going, I'm going to be there. And so I want to say a few words about the great Jamie Newberg of the Newberg Report, who is our special guest. And you can see him squirming already. He's like, God, I don't want to talk about myself. And when I first started talking to the Paranoid Fan guys about this event, they were like, well, we figure about half and half. Half on Jamie, half on Rangers baseball. And I was like, you guys don't know Jamie, do you? It's hard to give him a single compliment, much less spend 30 minutes talking about what makes him tick. So you can see him squirming around here. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to talk Rangers baseball. But screw Jamie. Screw what he wants. Um... <laughs> This is one of the most amazing dudes I've, I've ever known. And this sounds really dark, but this is the best compliment I can give. Gotten to know Jamie Newberg over the years, and I've got three kids. And if my wife and I were to tragically pass in a helicopter accident, I would totally be cool with Jamie Newberg uh, raising my kids because that's the type of guy he is. Um, I, you know, he's just as good of a guy as you could ever meet. On top of that, he's unbelievably good at talking about baseball. And I'm like, how do you have a real job on top of this? But he does. Uh, he's a very successful attorney. And um, I started doing some investigatory work on Jamie. I was like, man, how's this guy pulling it off? He's a scam. This is you know, several years after being one of my best friends. And it turns out that he got like a 2300 on his SAT, which has never been done. And 
I was like, Jamie, did you really get a 2300 on your SAT? Because I got a 610 and they told me to learn a trade. And I didn't know you could go up to 2300. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, I hear rumors that you almost walked on the UT baseball team. And he obviously doesn't want to talk about that either. So I had to go to other people. They're like, yeah, he, he was like one of the last guys cut, almost walked on at UT. So amazingly brilliant guy and a very good baseball player. I could, he's, he's over here going, Ugh. I mean, this hurts him right now. But uh, one of the best dudes I've ever known. And uh, when we prep for our show every day, you know, we read everything we can. We're reading national guys. We're reading local guys. But I'll be damned if the best information we get to start our show is it from the Newberg Report, from a guy you know who's also you know a, a, an important guy in a law firm taking care of real business. But he's I guess his brain is that big from that 2300 that he can do it all. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome and a giant round of applause to one of my best friends in the world, the great Jamie Newberg. How uh, how do you how do you juggle it all? How how are you able to uh, do all that you do? Let's give it up for Ben Rogers, guys. <laughs> ben Rogers. <laughs> Can y'all hear me in back? I guess that's probably better, right? Um, I mean, is it is it is it legit? I mean, seriously, I won't beat you up. I won't spend a lot of time on this. But is it? You only sleep like an hour a night, right? That's that's true. I will admit to that that I don't sleep enough. Um, which many of you can probably attest to by the time your emails show up in your inbox and the tweets hit your Twitter timeline. And I do need to sleep more, but I, you know, I, can't, I haven't figured out a way to do that yet. All right, let's, let's get right into it. And uh, I want to talk about the night that the Prince Fielder trade happened because, man, it blindsided us. And J.D. later said it came together in 24 hours. So what is the first thought you had when the Rangers acquired Prince Fielder? How many big Ian Kinsler fans do we have in the room tonight? I know Amber. I know Amber is. You didn't have to raise your hand. I'm an Ian Kinsler fan, but I thought there was no way that they were going to be able to uh, work out that log jam in the middle infield by trading him. And I was deathly afraid they were going to trade one of the other guys for different reasons. You know, I, to me, this is Elvis Anderson's team. Flip side is. Even if Jerickson Profar doesn't turn into what everybody says he's going to be, and he still might, to have a guy that you can start in the middle infield at the minimum salary for three years and then an ex escalating salary for three more years and not have to pay a guy to play that position, what you were paying Kinsler, I thought, you got to keep those two guys to make the whole thing work. But I just didn't think after the season Kinsler had last year that there was any way they were going to be able to find a team to take his contract on. And if you had to eat a bunch of his contract, what's the point? But they found, it, they found the right trade. Uh, it makes sense um, because they, they needed to get more left-handed. They needed more power. They got Fielder at the right time. If Fielder had a Prince Fielder season, he's never available. So they're, they're counting on a bounce back from him in a new environment. And I really think this is one of those cliche trades that really will work for both teams. And, you know, if, if, if Kinsler and Fielder bounce back even just a little bit, both teams are going to be very happy they made the deal. All right, so, you know, with the, the Tigers kicking in $30 million, it ends up being a seven-year deal, $138 million. The money that we're seeing thrown around right now in baseball, it's ridiculous. When you look at Feldman's deal and some of these other deals, you're like, good Lord, are you seriously paying that much money? So Prince Fielder, 29, he's a free agent right now in this market. What do, you, what do you think he might get? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the way to look at it because right now that's about the number that's being rumored for Shinsu Chu. And you give me the choice between these two, those two players, naturally I want both. But if you had to choose one or the other, you can give me Fielder. I mean, there's no, no question that Fielder can impact a game. He's more likely to impact a game than Chu is. Chu's a, a very good player and he will contribute to very good teams. But Fielder can carry a team for a while. You know, on the open market, he's probably, you know, a 25 million year guy. And which, you know, which he basically was until Detroit threw some money our way. Unbelievable. So they got him for seven and 138. And it would probably be at least talking about eight and 200 if he was free in this. So that's a massive discount. And that's what this front office appears to be about. Finding bargains, finding guys who can potentially outperform their contract, not the opposite. So in your opinion, where does that leave them with uh, Shinsu Chu? 
you know, I think that the JD has played this right. And, and I don't know for a fact that they want Chu. You know, a lot of the national media seems to say that they're going to end up with Chu or Cruz, and most people think probably Chu. It may be that the Rangers have no interest at the numbers, that the dollars that it's going to take with, with a Scott Boris client like that after he's already, you know, gotten what he's gotten for Ellsbury. You can legitimately say Chu's a better player, healthier guy, deserves more. If the Rangers really do want him, I think they've played it right in the sense that they've weighted the market out. You know, Seattle's made their moves. Detroit's obviously made its move. A couple other teams that were said to be in on Chu have made other, other additions. It may be right now that there's not, unless there's one of these mystery teams that jumps out or Detroit decides once again to throw more money at the thing, it may be that the Rangers have somehow gotten leverage over Scott Boris, which is a very hard thing to do. Maybe they actually get him at their number, whatever that is. Man, I'm just looking around. There's so many cool people here tonight, people that I follow on Twitter. So many great baseball folks. Uh, the great Ted Price. I see Devin Pike, Tepid P, all the shutdown inning guys. I mean, God bless all you guys for coming out tonight, man. This is, this is going to be a blast. And I hope all you guys won't shy away from coming up and uh, asking questions because I know there's some – I see the great Bob Pike back there, some great baseball minds here. God bless you guys for being here. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Ryland Rowe. See you the great Ryland Rowe. Look at the – unbelievable. The house is packed. Um, so that said, I mean, we, we know that uh, what, you're, what you're talking about here is why you would even bring up that maybe they're not even in on Shinsu Chu would be because they've shown restraint. The Rangers will get to a point where they're like, yes, interested in the player, but not going beyond this point. Very rarely will they go beyond their comfort zone. Is there anything about Shinsu Chu that makes you think that, yeah, okay, right now they would go beyond their comfort zone for this player. You know, I, I was thinking about that the past couple of days when it started to look like they may be the only team left that was willing to go to that level. If you look at the Kinsler fielder trade, I think one thing that it proved that I had some doubt about, and I bet the Rangers did too, is whether there is really a player in baseball that is untradeable, a contract that's untradeable. Maybe the fielder trade convinced them that no matter what you pay for Chu, as long as ownership is willing to write the check, doesn't necessarily mean you can't move him in three or four years to a team that's desperate for that guy that can play corner, maybe even some center field, get on base, if at that point the Texas doesn't need him so badly. Maybe there's no such thing any longer as an untradeable contract. You may have to take on a contract that's not so great, but for a shorter term or something like that. And if they convince themselves that you don't, you don't necessarily – take on an albatross contract by signing a guy for seven years that you really don't want to put seven years into, there may be a way toward the back end to get out of it. So if, if they've crossed that line in their mind and feel like that he's a player they can afford to add for the first four or five years of that deal when the window's wide open here, and which isn't to say it's closing after that, but when you look at Darvish's deal and Beltre's deal and even Anders's deal before the opt-out, these next four years or so, is, they're key. And if you can get Chu for, those, uh, Chu for those few years, even if you're worried that after that his game might decline, there's no reason to believe you can't still move that contract afterwards. Well, let, but let's talk about opportunity cost. I mean, because you know, we get a lot of calls on our show and texts or whatever, said, hey, man, Rangers are just dumb, man. They don't want to spend no money. They're like the Mavericks. They want that dry powder. I'm like, good <laughs> God, no. It's not how it works. But, hey, man, they ain't signed nobody, man. And uh, so, man, pay Shin Chu Chu, pay everybody. And I'm um, like, man, it doesn't work that way. And, you know, if you go ahead and give in to Scott Boris and his evil numbers and you overpay for Shin Chu Chu, potentially that takes you out of the market for David Price when he's a free agent or Max Scherzer or maybe even extending you Darvish. So nobody goes to a Ranger game and holds up a cardboard sign that says financial restraint. Woohoo! Nobody cares about that. So how do you balance all that? As, as a front office, maybe that's a great trait to have, but you know, a, a fan base that's already worried about losing Nolan Ryan and what does that mean and how do we put a contender back on the field, I guess what I'm saying is, is there pressure on this front office to go ahead and give in and overpay right now? I, I would guess that some of the same fans that are calling in complaining about this restraint we're probably complaining that Matt Garza was an overpay, that we gave up too much to get him, and maybe they did. But, Amber, are you not a Matt Garza fan? Was that? 
Okay. Well, I, I okay. We I, I get that. It was. It, and I look. Matt Garza was an overpay, but it's the flip side of what you're talking about. Like a lot of people, not a lot. There are fans out there that complain that the Rangers don't take that final step. They finish second a lot. They finish second on Grinky. Maybe they finish second on Hamilton. We don't really know. And some others like that. But at the same time, they are willing to give up too much to get the right guy. And I think that speaks not only to JD and his crew, but it speaks to the ownership group. And this is not a salary cap league. So when you talk about, you know, if we sign Chu, are we necessarily out on Tanaka? Or can we not extend Darvish? Well, no. You know, it just, it's all up to whether ownership wants to, wants to write that extra check. They're coming into a big amount of TV money in a couple years. The payroll probably will go up. And the restraint, I think, is not because they sort of are butting up against, you know, a luxury tax line or something like that. I think they're just looking at player by player. Is it too much to spend on that guy? Or do we want to save? Or maybe it's because we got a player coming up at a, at a, posi- at a position or two. We don't want us to devote five years and too much money to this guy if he's going to block a kid that's going to be here in two years. So I want to move on to the uh, Gentry deal because I was uh, I was really surprised by that deal because in all respect to Groobs and uh, he's like he's like inching closer. I know. You. <laughs> if he pulls out a weapon, somebody grab him. Uh, you know, love Gentry, but fourth outfielder. You know what? In his thirties already and platoon guy and they were able to trade him in their division and get the number two prospect from that team and i was digging around and i was i was calling some people in the front office i was like man high five on that deal i can't believe you fleeced him and um the response i got was well gentry is a winning piece and i i heard that there was tons of interest in gentry tons but specifically only from the teams who care about sabermetrics and those types of things. Statistical-based teams were very interested in him. Uh, some of the other teams were, nah, you know, fourth outfitter, no big deal. Why, before we even get to that deal, why why would that be? Why would somebody tell me that, that, hey, this the sabermetric-based teams were fascinated by the pl- possibilities of platooning Gentry? Because he's just about the best defensive center fielder in baseball right now. And even though he's limited to a role because he doesn't hit right-handed pitching, you know, if he's playing 35, 40% of the games and then coming into all the rest of them in the eighth inning to play center field, especially for a team that has a guy like Coco Crisp who's injury prone, you want to get him off his feet in a game that's in hand or maybe give him two days off a week so that you're sure you've got him at the end of the season, he makes a lot of sense. I'm a huge Gentry fan, and he was a winning piece, and he added a dimension to this team that before him it was missing. Now, whether they still have that dimension may depend a lot on whether Angel Beltre, you know, earns the trust of the franchise in camp because he's out of options, which everybody knows means he's on somebody's big league roster opening day. If it's not here, he's not going back to the minors. Someone else is going to claim him off waivers. But that's what he is. He may be a better center fielder than Gentry. If you just look at the defensive ability and his range and his arm and his, his routes and everything that it takes to play center field, Beltre has all that. What he doesn't have yet is the faith of the manager. And Gentry earned that over time. He wasn't an immediate, you know, he didn't make an impact immediately. It took him a couple years to get to where he was getting more than just bit roles with the team. But at age 30, um, he's cemented, you know, a role in the game as a guy that can hit right-handed, can run. Obviously, you know, the guy never gets thrown out stealing. He's not just fast, but he's a good base runner. And I, I thought it was a little risky for Texas to make that deal. I think it's also risky for Oakland because he's clearly a window player. At that age, you know, he's going to have a couple good years left, and after that, his game's going to recede a little bit just because when your game depends on your legs and you're already 30, that's going to subside a little bit. And they traded a kid that they had six years of control over and has the ability to hit the kind of power, with the kind of power that you want on the corners if it comes together, and the Rangers scouts obviously think it will. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the other side of that. Obviously, the Rangers – knew what a valuable piece Gentry was. They knew that people were knocking down their door to a degree interested in Gentry. So why would they make that deal? Well, I, you know, again, I think it's because unless they want to go pay for Chu or Cruz, right now left field is kind of an open book. And, and when, you, when you have a contending roster and you're spending contending money on your payroll, you can't really go with a hole in left field, which isn't to say they didn't go with a hole in left field last year because they kind of did. But they, they had an opportunity here to add a guy that if, you know, again, 
the scouts have to believe that Michael Choice is the guy that he looked like two years ago in terms of his power ability and his ability to draw a walk and, and all those things. If that comes together, he's, he's a, you know, like we were talking about Profar, he's a guy that you can count on for 145 games at a minimum salary and actually make an impact. So I don't think they were looking to trade Craig Gentry, but the opportunity to add Choice when you've got a guy like Beltre that could replace Gentry theoretically, they probably lost some sleep over it, but eventually that's why they made the deal. So you now look over at a vulnerable – sweet young man like Groobs and you see him all empty inside just walking kind of like a zombie I don't have a favorite player anymore I need a new nickname guy I mean is who are the guys who you would handicap that to kind of fill that void in this young man's life Ooh. Um, can I interest you in a JP or in Sebia I no. Thumbs down. Thumbs know. down from Groobs. I don't see I don't really fully understand what did it for Groobs <laughs> other than the fact that he adopted the nickname. I'm sure that was a big deal. So um, you know, I, I think Leonis Leonis may have some potential in that sense. Groobs uh, is open to Leonis, everybody. <laughs> More than anything, I think Groobs needs a hug from just about all of you. Yeah, so. especially the ladies. Go in chest first. <clears throat> um <clears throat> All right, talking to the great Jamie Newberg here at this Paranoid Fan Event. That's a radio reset. No need for that since we're <clears throat> not on, since we're not really on the radio right now. This is uh, paranoidfan.com. <clears throat> All right, so uh, when Feldman got his deal, what were you thinking? I was shocked. And, you know, Good for him, by the way. You know, he for a guy that's you know was a 30th round pick, he's created not only a major league career where he's got a job every year, but he's got ridiculous security now. And good for him. But every year there's a couple teams, and it used to be Oakland. You remember? You guys remember when Oakland signed Ben Sheets for 10 million dollars when he couldn't pass a physical? There were a couple of years there where Oakland. I I will sw swear it's never like been confirmed. But I think they got a memo from the commissioner basically saying you got to spend some money. Because there were a couple years in a row where they, they signed a couple guys like, you know, where did that come from? The Astros have done it a couple times now. Chad Qualls got a ridiculous contract. And then Feldman, and I think, and again, this is, you know, conspiracy theory, but I, it wouldn't sh surprise me if they got a fax on the machine saying you're not spending enough on your payroll kick it up a little bit so they just threw some money at Feldman he'll be a good influence a good role model for other pitchers and you know he's I don't know if he still li lived in Texas or not or if he'd moved out elsewhere but um, you know good for him but he, he 